Hello, everybody. Welcome back here to our series on Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of world history. Yes, welcome. Today, we'll be talking about the state and geography, which is the third aspect of the state that uh, Hegel discusses. We previously spoke about religion, art, and culture, and also briefly talk about, well, not, not so briefly, spoke about science. Well, Hegel did talk extremely briefly, but we made that so much less brief. Yeah, we helped them out there. Yeah, we helped them out a bit. And now we're going to go to the third aspect, which is geography, uh, nature, you know, the locality where a culture takes place, where world historical events take place. I think a good way to begin is just to look at what Hegel writes. He says, the principles, these principles have a necessary succession in time and likewise a concrete spatial specificity, a geographical position. So just as we're concerned with events that take place in time. We're also concerned about where they're taking place. And, you know, Hegel's general point, the overall point, is that where something takes place matters. It is affected by where it is. And, yeah. Indeed. So, and, uh, yeah. So, you know, so, so, something that comes to mind very early when thinking about this is so, sort of geographical determinism one hears about in various talks about nations and histories and so on yeah you know this nation has big wide lands therefore they form a sort of landlocked kind of culture and a culture that is cl close by the sea will do a lot of seafaring and develop their culture based on those things that's and right yeah. so the in in that in the in the geographical determinism the geographical circumstances the geography determines the human culture and their histories right. to a large extent yeah yeah so a hardcore geographical determinist will like presumably explain almost everything by the kinds of limitations and advantages that a particular culture would get right yeah from their land from from, from their yeah. land yeah from the climates from everything yeah yeah and we shall see here today just to what extent Hegel thinks this uh, uh, element is important. Yeah. So I actually, um, I'd like to know how unique Hegel is in this respect. Because, so the editors of this of these lectures, they cite people that he would have read, Humboldt being one of them. Mm -hmm. But I wonder how advanced this geographic deterministic position was in Hegel's time. Because right now, in the current state of things, it it looks like a very popular theory. Uh, you see a lot of books on it. And I wonder to what extent, you know, we should be praising Hegel for sort of having this insight, for making room for geography in the in the development of world history, or to what extent he's just um, you know getting it from reading people like Ritter, Karl Ritter, apparently, mm -hmm. or Humboldt. But that's really just a yeah a side point. It it does make a lot of sense to include it uh, in his uh, systematic, like ref, uh, based on his system and the way it proceeds, particularly in the philosophy of spirit, where spirit begins in again also in sort of geographical and natural circumstances, the immediate situation, right? And that is what the geographic the geography kind of re uh, represents here is that it's the, uh, a culture's immediacy or a mm. state's immediacy that's what yeah. they have to work with and yeah. live with, uh, will live with so as you said earlier what we're interested in what hegel is interested in is to what extent geography impacts on world history and another interesting thing that he says again in the in the in the first few paragraphs uh that nature is an element of lesser influence the natural aspect climate does not account for the individual. So whilst history lives on the soil of the natural, uh, this is only one aspect. And he says the higher aspect is that of spirit. Yeah. So I think Hegel, and I think this, uh, we can discuss this as we go along, uh, especially with some examples, which seem to almost contradict this initial downplaying of geography. But Hegel seems to be saying here at the outset that whilst locality is important, 
it's not more important than spirit than the things we've been talking about then it's not more important than religion art culture yeah i mean he he plays as a little joke here you know that uh Dionian sky had was an influence of on Homer and why you know we had Homeric poetry appear, but this you know the same sky is shared by Turkey and there is no Homer coming out of Turkey. Yeah, or it's okay, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or Syria or what have you, right? Uh, although they might have other uh, you know their own great poets and so on and so forth. Uh, right, but for reasons that are not reducible to the environment. Yeah, I think. So, so let's, I guess, I don't know, how do you want to go through this? Do you want to, because Hegel has a, like a step-by-step -step analysis of the breakdown of geography, which I think is, is, is very hard to take um, systematically seriously. Uh, we, we, we can, we can deal with that. I think uh, uh, I want to raise a point just about this relationship between nature and spirit. Yeah. So it seems like, um nature can can be a force of oppression for spirit in the sense mm -hmm. that if one lives in a difficult terrain difficult climate then or there where there's little resources and so on one has to just work so much more in order to just get by right to survive right. yeah leaving less time to do other stuff right and that this seems very pragmatic um the kind of back uh the core consideration hegel gives here mm -hmm. that uh insofar as nature is kind of overwhelming the spiritual element cannot flourish yeah yeah and in fact the spiritual element just remains an identity with the natural and doesn't really distinguish itself from it yeah so it's interesting so like if we think of maybe one way of sort of testing this would be to think of okay let's look at cultures that are really struggling and see how they sort of identify themselves and portray themselves and act, right? Whether they take on a lot of naturalistic elements, portraying themselves as animals and so forth, or whether they are kind of portraying a more human, non-animal element, right? This could be an interesting test to, mm -hmm. to put out, see if uh, you know Hegel's concept here has some empirical bearing. But I think... Maybe this is what you mean as well. But when Hegel says that it remains an identity, I think also what he's saying is that spirit is just is just concerned with the sensuous. It's yeah. just purely concerned with nature, and yeah. it doesn't have the luxury of uh, reflecting on itself, or even develop you know more sophisticated technologies, yeah. more sophisticated cultural things, what have you, right? So uh... what's, what's interesting about this? So I think I think I think this makes I agree with you. I think pragmatically this makes a lot of sense. What's interesting about it is the way technology might uh, make it no longer an issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm thinking of a place like Dubai right now. Uh, up until I think 60 years ago, a general generally acknowledged inhospitable environment. Uh, now, you know, the center of like world finance and pretty much anything you could ever want is there. And, uh, you know, huge example of how to do sewage in your city. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they've got a lot of ways to get through. Um, so I think Hegel is obviously very, con I think this consideration, but then again, you might say that, you know, okay, even though a place like Dubai has managed through technology to deal with all these things, there are still a lot of limitations. Nature, the fact of nature still requires you to confront it. So yeah, you yeah. still need to, you know, have, I don't know, air conditioned spaces you have to you have to plan for the fact that it's a very warm place you have to plan for the fact that there are occasionally sandstorms yeah, and yeah. so on and so forth and uh those technologies and and those things have to themselves be developed somewhere right right presumably in a, away from this this situation so it's right. um you kind of need to go to the easy places first the places that 
don't give you a hard time that mm -hmm. give you as much advantages as possible and then uh, build from there and once you've built up a number of you know resources technology and so forth then you can branch out because it's easier to get into the more rugged and hard harder areas right yeah right so here we see you know reason very being very pragmatic but also the cunning of reason and how something that is inhospitable as the great example you bring out with dubai can be turned into perfectly hospitable yeah area yeah definitely It is funny how, um, so now moving on to some, unless, do you want to continue this? Or no, move on no to go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so Hegel seems to be very disinterested in the new world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very surprising. Yeah, this uh, is something that I ask myself a lot. So I want to, I want to just focus on one sentence, which is interesting. So, uh, he writes the sentence where he talks the new world is not new is new not only negatively blah 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 well, maybe we should begin from that sentence the new world is new not only negatively in regard to its relationship to the old world it is also new in regard to its physical and spiritual properties um it's so bizarre so on the one hand, you you got new kind of new states forming in Americas, right? Mm -hmm. Especially the you know the United States. There's, their constitution was written in eighteen no seventeen eighty seven thereabouts, mm -hmm. which is pretty you know at Hegel's time that was like super fresh state. Yeah, and I'm surprised why he doesn't analyze that because here yeah. we have people who have who are coming from Europe or, you know, have and, and uh, parents coming from Europe and, and whatnot. And they want to build a new state from the ground up and they're putting down foundations and ideals. And it's puzzling why he doesn't, wouldn't want to be more keen on analyzing that. Those, yeah. Those things, because there is clearly a lot of thought put into it. Yeah. So there is, there is a whole paragraph, right? Where he talks about America and as you say, he's he's genuinely uninterested. One reason that he gives, right, is that he he sees America as still being a country, he calls it a country of becoming of the future. And I guess maybe he 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 doesn't so my 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 uh inclination is to think that he doesn't think it's going to be anything special. Because he's talking about, in that same paragraph, just a bit above, he says, but when all the, he's talking about how excited people are going to America, settling new parts of it, you know, cultivating the land, so on and so forth. He, he says, but when all the land has been occupied so that there are internal social pressures and the need for trade arises, the state must necessarily develop to the point of having to maintain a different system of government. The beginnings there are European in nature. So he, he sees America and he does he just doesn't see it as being a properly formed state yet, because the way the people are living or the kinds of problems or the, the kinds of relations that people have to the land are are not those of a properly formed state yet. The fact that people can constantly move outwards and find new land. And there aren't the kinds of, as he says, internal social pressures and the need for trade that occupy other states at this stage suggests to him that it's still not a, well, it's still a country of becoming. It can't be properly discussed as it is. I think that's a, uh, that, that 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 point he raises it just seems so inconsequential yeah mm. so what if the land fills up with everybody people i mean yeah then they'll do, go on doing other things 
I was like, why is why is that you know key concern? Yeah, why is it? I guess he sees it as inconsequential, right? Yeah, I do agree with you that he sees uh, maybe he doesn't see like a, you know a lot of action happening on that side of the world. And boy, was he wrong about that one. Well, yeah, indeed, definitely. Holy crap! And a very interesting little prediction though on the tension between the southern and the northern states yeah right yeah i don't know well, yeah well it's uh, uh, well, even in hegel's time that he would have known that historically there's been conflict between uh the english and the Sp- Sp- uh, spanish portuguese and so on right and they they had holdings in south and middle america so he would have he should have known that there would have been a lot of issues there so uh, before they went to think England. one question we have to ask ourselves sorry i think one question we have to ask ourselves is why doesn't hegel put any in any stock in civilizations like the maya the aztec the incas that was my second thing because because they seem from my little knowledge of what hegel's going to go on to say they seem to be very similar to to the kind of state that we're going to analyze in China or maybe India, for example, like you have an emperor, maybe Persia as well, or Egypt as well. You have an emperor, yeah. a supreme, like a main leader, and then you have sort of the rest of the people. And the, those cultures could very easily fall into that discussion that Hegel ends up having about China, India, Persia, Egypt. I wonder, I wonder if Hegel doesn't care about them because he doesn't think, oh, there, ha- there wasn't any, obviously, but because there wasn't any historical communication or historical contact, or they were sort of outside the material development. Yeah, that could be. So um, I'm thinking two more issues. Mm-hmm. So one is that Hegel just didn't have enough knowledge, right, available to him. Yeah, I don't know enough about, other his, mean, about yeah. these other cultures. Yeah, possible. Uh, yeah, and then secondly, which is something that he brings up later in in this section, is that they were just feeble and weak and didn't, you know, they didn't survive, and therefore they don't merit our consideration. Okay, but let's but take that, that on. But if yeah. that's the case, then why are we talking about the Greeks or the Egyptians or the Romans or the Chinese? You know, the exactly. ancient imperial yeah. China. Like they didn't survive either. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you picked that up as well because I made a note on that a bit too. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, survival clearly has nothing to do with it. And he calls them civilization. So clearly he recognizes that aspect of them. I so yeah, I was confronted by that dilemma as well. And the only thing that I could come up with was that sort of historical So as I was saying, I think the best way to make sense of it, because you're right to point out that them being of feebler stock shouldn't disqualify them from being part of world history because the Egyptians, the Persians, the Greeks, they all were destroyed. I suspect that Hegel's idea is that they shouldn't be part of world history because they're not part of the material historical development. So because they have no contact with the rest of the world. That's my suspicion. So when you say material development, do you mean like the Incas and Mayans, they didn't have a big effect on uh, European and Asian culture, right? How, how, you know, global sort of influence? Well, they had no effect on any of the cultures up until modern, uh, early modern Europe, right? Until 1492. There was no connection between Aztecs, Mayas, Incas, and China yeah. or Persia yeah. or Egypt. Right. Um, so that could be Hegel's thinking. Um, 
but even once there was any contact established it's not like a lot of things were kind of picked up from the mayans for the europeans and, and so on and so forth or the exactly, rest of the world yeah. exactly yeah exactly so when i was reading this I, I was thinking a lot about this and i was thinking about you know would there be place for them because now we have loads of stuff about these three cultures in my undergraduate degree where i studied french and spanish for example i took a lovely course on uh, mayas aztecs and incas and there's a shitload about them now yeah and you, know, you could easily include it you could easily you could easily write their chapter on world history the question is would it make sense from a hegelian mm. perspective right i i'm of two minds on the one hand i'm not con i'm not sure i find the explanation i gave convincing i'm not sure it matters that there are historical material connections between cultures uh, for, for, for as as a way of expressing the development of world history mm -hmm. but i'm not sh and the only reason why i'm not sure i think it matters is because it sounds like we're putting a bit too much onus on uh empirical things mm -hmm. and we seem to be concerned i mean i don't know we'll, we'll have to go on and see what hegel says but i don't think hegel says you know people in india looked at what people in china were doing and china and india existed at the same time it's not like one collapsed and the other one then rose up and did something in response to china um so i'm not really convinced that there is this material connection that needs to be made um and on the other hand I also understand the importance of the material connection that Hegel wants to make because yeah. we are talking about world history. It's rooted in, in events, in spatiality. So, yeah. Yeah. But this also gives us an idea of the kind of nature of world history as Hegel lays it out, mm -hmm. why some cultures or civilizations or historical epochs are in fact, more relevant than others, they are not equally all relevant. They can be all relevant from a curiosity standpoint, you know, the standpoint of um, wanting to know what human beings were up to. But in terms of what influenced what and what sort mm -hmm. of lived on, right? Yeah, the Roman civilization civilization collapsed, this, you know, the empire didn't move, live on and so on. But we, you know, we we taken up a lot of their principles, like I don't know, uh, plumbing, organization, architecture, you know, various different things that you can see a kind of have moved on and lived on into um, later cultures and up to modernity. So we can mm -hmm. we can sort of trace ourselves back to that because we recognize ourselves in them. Whereas yeah. it's much harder for us to do something like that with the Mayans or the Incas because so little of them actually lived on, you know, and, and care, survived up until their own time. Yeah. So we have to kind of do very difficult acrobatic feats of thinking, well, despite of this gulf, they are human beings trying to live on and figure things out. So in that sense, we always will have a fundamental connection, mm -hmm. but it's not one that is um, a practical one. Yeah. History is all about practice. Yeah, yeah. And the only way that one could possibly make it relevant would be, unfortunately, a very Eurocentric way, which is uh, seeing the impact of these cultures in the modern states that now exist in uh, in Latin America mm -hmm. and Central America. Um, so... I. <sighs> Mexican religion, for example, even uh, Christianity in Peru, it's it's a it's a hybrid of Christianity and the original uh, the native religions. Yeah, that could be a way that you might look at the modern state in this region of the world with reference to these older civilizations, and then you might have some kind of historical development playing out there. But 
uh, maybe uncomfortably for some, you are placing the emphasis on the turn to um, to more European style governments or to coming into communication with Europe and uh, and sort of yeah becoming part of world history by sort of tacking onto it as uh, European contact was made with the American continent. Yeah, yeah. But that seems to be like a point of departure um, because that's the kind of context we in, inhabit in our consciousness and the histories mm -hmm. we've been uh, up, brought up with. Right. I mean, yeah. Something is very interesting. It's definitely worth thinking about more. Um, but let's move on to, to some of the more specific things that Hegel talks about. So Hegel distinguishes the three continents that matter, for him at least, Europe, yeah. Asia, and Africa. Apparently, there are just three continents. <laughs> for world history, there are only three continents, I'm afraid. And he he sort of distinguishes them according to uh, the their physical properties. They have three main features. Yes. Right. Yeah. So he writes: in Africa proper, the highland is the main feature. Yeah. In Asia, the fertile, abundant plains and alluvial valleys. In Europe, mountain ranges are found, alternating with valleys, hills, and plains, with no single element predominating. The character of spirit differs in the three current continents in similar fashion. Oh, I think this <laughs> needs a bit more justification. Yeah, it's a little bit thin. It's a bit, it's thin, it's, it feels very forced. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. and why three, right? It yeah. seems, he kind of gives it away when he says, oh yeah, it's uh, you know appropriately rational because everything uh, rational is in threes and so on, right? It's like, yeah. so you squeeze in the Middle East with Asia? Well, right? I mean, the Middle East is, I mean, the Middle East is part of Asia, right? I mean, that is a continent on its own. Yeah, but in, t in terms of histories and cultures, they're just ah, so right. different, right? In he like yeah. even India and China are just so different. Yeah, and then you have you know, uh, Thailand and the in Indonesia and Japan, right? God dang, it's like are you just gonna? Well, he doesn't really talk about Japan, does he? No, he doesn't talk about Japan. Well, we who knows? Uh, maybe he'll do that, do that later on. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I so for a my... And I guess this is a problem that we might have a lot with these lectures on world history. It's difficult to see the necessity mm. of these claims. Yes. Uh, it really looks as if Hegel... It looks as if he's doing it the wrong way around. It's as if he's looking at these places, he's looking at these three continents, Yeah. and he's trying to just draw certain universal properties that can kind of distinguish them from each other and and he's um, doing it in a way that uh, it seems to be more geographically determined than spiritually determined yeah yeah which does not need to be the case right uh you could say that you know the egypt is closer to asia the way the civilization was doing things over there than the rest of africa right um and uh, uh, so on the other way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's just like he he falls into his own critique of the French in this section, where the French were mm -hmm. saying like, yeah, they see rivers and so on as boundaries, but really it's kind of points of access. But you're doing the same thing when you're carving up the world into these three spheres, um, Hegel. So you know, yeah. Yeah. And then he goes into even more detail, actually. So he when he's talking about Africa, for example, he talks about how it's, you know, he talks about the rivers 
and he talks about the mountains and the interior and the vegetation and the coastline and the deserts. And they all seem to be important to uh, explaining world history in Africa. But as you remember, Hegel's not a geographer, right? He's not he's not meant to be doing this kind of explanation. He's meant to be doing a, a conceptual analysis. So it's difficult to see what justifies the inclusion of rivers and mountains and vegetation yeah. in in a conceptual analysis of world history. Yeah, it's like it, it, these things can be extremely important when you're founding a new city, a new settlement, right? Access to water, access to resources and so on, right? It makes things easier for you. You can have more time to develop culture and technology and so on. But then once all those things get going, the natural stuff kind of gets phased out. Mm. It becomes a secondary concern. Alternatively, Hegel maybe isn't doing conceptual analysis. I mean, it, it sounds like he is. But well, he... I in large part, it, it sounds like he isn't. It sounds more like he's just giving us a kind a geography of quick, lesson. Yeah, a quick geography lesson. Yeah. I mean, the only reason why I say it sounds like it is because he's giving these cratic structures. Yeah. So it's three continents. It's three elements. Um. There's another triadic structure. I don't want to skip too far ahead. But um... but but like never mind whether he or not he um, actually maps on correctly to this or that sort of sure, geographical yeah. circumstance. Yeah. The whole the main issue is can <laughs> the world actually be carved up in any meaningful uh, way that is kind of discrete and categorical? Yeah. In terms of world history. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I read, I thought I've mentioned this book that I read many times, How Religion Evolved. Yes. And uh, part of the book is talking about the development to monotheistic religions. And as part of the explanation for the rise in monotheism, he uses... Um, I'm going to use the wrong terminology, but an analysis done by archaeologists or historians of where a lot of civilizations occurred, big cultures. And it's like this belt, roughly like in the middle of the world. So not too far down, not too far up. Yeah. So like Mesopotamia, that kind of place where very fertile, good weather, that kind yeah. of stuff. And a lot of the monotheistic religions occur along this belt around the world. Um, so that's that's a kind of carving up of the world. That look, there's there's there is a discrete portion of the world where, owing to climate, it's more amenable to large scale societies. And, and history mostly follows this pattern most yeah. of the large scale civilizations that we know of occurred around this this belt yeah so you know uh i don't know much more about it but i just know that people think that yeah and uh, that's you know intuitively makes sense and it follows what we re read earlier here today with regards to how you know, we can't live in a totally inhospitable place. Culture, spirit can't flourish there. Right. And yet, these are also not the, the factors that determine um, uh, the um, development of world history as such, right? Yes. Well, because they the don't thing, determine right? individuals. Yeah. Yeah. So when he's talking about Asia, he makes a big deal about the people from the mountains and the people from the plains. And that tension is part of the world history of Asia. And that just seems very specific. And also extremely vague at the same time. 
<laughs> and extremely vague at the same time. Yeah. Um, and also, I don't think Hegel needs to make these kinds of grand explanations of the world. I think, first and foremost, he needs to explain, he needs to sort of account for the fact that geography matters. Okay, cool. Yeah, we all agree with that. That's also quite vague in general, but we agree it, it matters. Okay, to what extent does it matter? Look at a particular civilization and then tell us how it matters instead of you know taking a continent the size of asia and explaining it according to one feature sure right yeah. that seems yeah. the better way to do it yeah but uh, maybe in his defense this is more of a kind of flavor this is still part of the introduction <laughs> so he's just giving us a flavor of things Some and, then, and then he'll get to come. into more details when he actually talks about india and china yeah uh, I suspect I suspect that's true actually. I suspect uh, um a lot of this chapter is a bit of fluff. Yeah. So so but like even even so, right? Mm -hmm. He thinks that Europe, Asia and Africa stand in an essential relationship and constitute a rational totality. Seems like he's putting a lot of, you know, necessity in packaged into that. Yeah. Well, it turns out the Americas have developed statehood, so on, and, you know, pretty good states in some respects, like uh, world important states. So what, what now? Are we, is this a, you know, do we, is a, is it a new rational totality with four or more, right? How is that? How's that going to play in? Or do we, should we just, like, as revisionist Hegelians or modern Hegelians, should we just drop the whole three in this case and see it more as a kind of, not a kind of, not a kind of a pyramidic um, a grouping of continents, but rather particular individual states and see how they each kind of manifest the universal yeah so there it no longer matters the continents and so on that's just a category that just comes useless yeah yeah i i'm inclined to take up your proposal i'm inclined to think that that's how we should approach it because i do struggle to see the necessity in the distinct in saying something like these three continents form part of a rational whole and yeah or even a continent it, forming part of a rational whole and it's not even because of the existence of america even if just it's a bit of a caricature of spirit to yeah. invoke its working in the layout of the earth yeah and also like it's it seems also too too naive to suppose that just because something is bundled up together in one kind of geographical commonality then that should constitute a um, center point vis-a-vis -vis another geographical kind of commonality mm -hmm. doesn't see like the world doesn't seem to work that way yes european yeah. nations have a lot in common with one another mm -hmm. but each european nation can sort of decide to do things out on their own as well right yeah france has sort of pseudo colonial connections in africa still and yet everybody's supposed to play the european union um game So uh, it seems like uh, there's a lot of commonality in European nations and forming EU and whatnot, and yet there are pockets that are completely at odds with the institution, right? People, mm -hmm. Politicians, cultures that don't agree with it, and there is, uh, yeah, and that's, it seems like there is a lot of individualism spawning within nations, even though they're part of the 
same continent, right? Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. And so, yeah, so I think we agree that macro logical explanations of nature are not very successful. But I mean, there are stuff that Hegel says that are really good. So uh, on page two hundred two, halfway down, you're, uh, sorry, at the very beginning, says this geographical ground must not be taken to be an external occasion for history. Yeah, rather it has a specific property. It is of a distinct type to which the character of the peoples who emerge from it corresponds. And this is something that I'm broadly sympathetic to. I think it must matter if you grow up on an island or if you grow up around mountains or, or if you grow in a up desert. in a desert. Yeah, these things will matter. They will shape yeah. uh, some aspect of your being. Yeah. Uh, and I think Hegel is right to point this out. Now, the question is, how much do they matter? And this will obviously mm. depend from culture to culture. Yeah. And... I guess also, as we touched on in the beginning, it will probably depend according to how much technology you have, because you'll be able to mitigate the limitations of, of some things. But it's by no means a hard and fast rule. I, I'm reminded of an excellent example of... So you might think all island nations are good sailors, are good navigators, because they're island nations. But Japan, for example, are awful. The Japanese yeah. were awful navigators. They were terrible. Yeah. Yeah, they got their ass whipped by by the Koreans. Yeah, they did. In fact, they would use the Koreans to as sort of uh, uh, they would use Korean sailors to travel to China because they were such bad navigators. So their response to being an island was not navigation; it was a kind of a kind of isolationism, a kind of inward yeah. looking. Yeah. So I don't think you can generalize too much. So. There's a difference, right, between saying all island nations are, by virtue of being an island nation, will use the sea as a mode of connection with what yeah. is outside of them, yeah. and saying, if we look at Japan, we could say because they're an island nation in this case, that it prompted certain attitudes. Yeah. Uh, I think Hegel does the first one too much, maybe, and it's, bit, yeah. it's not very uh, convincing. But the second one, if he does, I think could be very fruitful. And indeed, it's what many historians do nowadays. It also, I think, uh, factors into the fact that geography is part of nature and nature is part of contingency. So you could probably make a statistical necessity out of out of a range of island nations, how many of these kind of become adept seafarers and how many of these choose isolations. Maybe you can right. find some sort of necessity there in the statistical odds, right? Maybe ninety percent of islands turn into sea great seafarers, and then ten percent turn out to be isolationists, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can mm -hmm. do that sort of uh, necessity. Uh, you could, the, but you could, but, but then it would. But other than that, uh, you can only rely on backwards looking, um, kind of. Yes, the, the the we can see the conditions that led to this kind of thing being developed, but those elements were only conditions, not themselves. Uh, determining the what the outcome would turn out to be. Yeah. Um, a, li a little further down from where I just I quoted before, Hegel says, because people are spirits of a particular type, the determinacy on the one hand is a spiritual determinacy, which then on the other hand corresponds to a natural determinacy, and their relationship is reciprocal. And I think, yeah, Hegel would do better to stick to this sort of thinking that. Yeah. Because of this established reciprocity between spirit and nature, there has to be some kind of relationship between being an island nation and whatever you end up doing. Um, and that is different to saying, because you're an island nation, you're going to be like this. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's more. It's better to just say, as an island nation, these are your conditions, yeah. which may lead to so-and-so outcomes. Exactly. And I think Hegel is, is doing great here. I think this is this yeah, is philosophical. 
this, this is, is much better yeah this is much <laughs> on a much sturdier ground i think yeah 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 um i think it's it's almost like um you know those criticisms that hegel got at the beginning of his sort of career when he wrote the philosophy of nature uh the famous uh line about deducing the pen that Herr krug is writing with mm -hmm. i think this kind of stuff would make someone suspicious of Hegel because he's deducing very uh, particular phenomena. He's trying to create conceptual necessity for what seem to be uh, contingent phenomena. Yeah. He's trying to deduce how many species of parrot there are mm -hmm. um, by generalizing about the continent of Asia. Yeah. And yeah, I think if we're being very charitable, like you said earlier, he's just messing up his conceptual analysis and his geography lesson yeah and he's just making them he's just bringing them a bit too close together yeah he's bungling the job yeah yeah although one thing that i sort of popped into my head now and that is to which extent you can have spirit and uh, nations and cultures really evoking geographical determinism as a reason for the way they are I think a real evocation would be a bad one. It would be when spirit and nature are in an identity. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, in terms of, like, uh, you have a nation that kind of portrays themselves, gives themselves a history, right, as all mm -hmm. nations do, and and they give the reason for being who their identity as being, yes, we are part of this, you know, mountain dwellers. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we are who we are. So that's a different thing from yeah. this kind of reflection on what actually is kind of a yeah. determining a, 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 a culture and a nation. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I this see. because this is a spiritual expression. Right. Yeah. That <laughs> employs maximal naturalness. Yeah. To sort of get to get give itself give its grounding. And I imagine that 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 kind of stuff would also be tied up with maybe a religious element. So there'd be a sort of a, a mythology of origin, yeah, um, related to the environment. Yep. Or that you know they have been the people living here, and this is just who we are, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be very good to actually have some examples of that. I can't think of any off the top of my head. <clears throat> Russia. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good example. Well, at least some ideologues uh, over on that side of the world seem to think in those terms, very sort yeah. of geographically deterministic, and that's very, very highly religiously infused as well, which is mm. bizarre. Because yeah, yeah. you're kind of bringing the extreme of nature and the extreme of spirit together. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Yeah, so I really don't have much more to say on this because most of this section is very specific examples. A little that, bit too much geography, yeah. Yeah, that I don't think is I don't think it's worth discussing because I don't think he's done enough to show that they're necessary. Yeah. For any of this. Uh, maybe once we get to the particular civilizations, indeed, he'll do a better job. Yeah. Another right, yeah. Another sort of thread we can pick out from these sections is when he, towards the very end, talks about <clears throat> the civilizations or places that can cultivate individualism or individual mm -hmm. the individual principle, individual mm -hmm. persons. He thinks is kind of the sort of progressive um, movement forward in history because uh, you get more uh, diversity in terms of like the ways in which spirit can form and, and where it can go and think and so forth. Mm -hmm. So maybe that becomes a kind of measure for world history uh, in terms of like how something, what a measure of uh, rationality I think I'm thinking of, right? Right. Yeah. Well, I guess it will be, a balance right between individual and the universal yeah 
sure uh, it's always going to be in terms of like how how much the the universal is capable of containing the individual and yet letting the individual express themselves exactly yeah. to be to to choose their own individualism because that's yeah. precisely something that's kind of uh, key to individualism is that it cannot be dictated or externally determined mm -hmm. and so in a nutshell or in an implicit sense states or nations are themselves individuals as you know self-determining uh elements or entities so how much they can replicate this within themselves is the marker of how rational they become yeah maybe mm -hmm. i'm thinking putting this out there yeah 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 It'll be good to keep an eye on that. Yeah. yeah. All right. I don't okay. have anything else you want to add. Good. No, no, no. I think we've uh, we've we've uh, dealt with geography. Yes, we weeded it out, and we 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 needn't visit it again. Well, no, unless it's not necessary. in not in this kind of gener generality <laughs> anymore. Anyway, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, tune in again. We'll We'll be talking about the division of world history next time. Yeah, which will we'll, uh, finally round up the uh, introductory section. Yeah, finally. It's taken a while, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, then. Well, that's all from do, us. Bye-bye. Yes. Thanks very much. Uh, let us know what you think below in the comments and, and so on. And what do you think uh, Hegel's you know, conceptualization of geography in the States and uh, its importance it sounds right, uh, sounds convincing? It'd be good to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you. Do you think that Asia is fundamentally the opposition between the highlands and the plains? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you think. Very important question. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, thanks very much. See you guys soon. Bye-bye.